speaker while we're getting ready. The next speaker is Sarah Werner, who works at the Folger Shakespeare Library. She's currently the library's digital media strategist, a position in which she seeks to connect the library, uh, library resources with digital tools to intend to open the material to scholars and the public. Sarah has written and presented on the connections between early modern books and digital tools, including in her role as the editor and chief writer for uh, the Collation, the library's research blog. She's the textual editor of The Taming of the Shrew for the forthcoming third edition of Norton Shakespeare. And she's currently writing a textbook for studying early books and exploring how digital editions of Shakespeare's plays represent performances. She's going to talk to us about disembodying the past. Sarah. focuses on issues of digital preservation. I'm a book historian and a performance scholar who works at a cultural heritage organization that is focused on the preservation and exploration of centuries-old objects. I think about the digital and preservation from the perspective of someone who studies the past and seeks new ways to make it accessible to scholars and the public. So, since I spend a lot of time thinking about the history of books, and since so many people see the rise of the digital heralding the end of print, they would be wrong, of course, I thought I would start off by looking at, back at some of the earliest surviving instances of movable type in the West. I was just thinking to myself, I don't have any animated GIFs, and I was feeling a little bit sorry that I hadn't included that, but then I've decided that this is the medieval equivalent of an animating gap, right? So the sort of melding of different technologies and is both print and hand on all at the same time. We all know, I think, that the first book printed by Johannes Gutenberg was the Bible in 1455. But that wasn't the earliest instance of print. Gutenberg's first printed texts were indulgences, short formulaic texts sold by the church and its deputies to fund various enterprises by promising purchasers they wouldn't need to spend as much time in purgatory for their sins. I hear you can get this on Twitter now, but you don't have to pay for the poll. What we're looking at is one of the earliest surviving copies of these get-out-of-jail-free cards. Now held at the University of Manchester's Rylands Library, this indulgence was printed in 1454 and was issued to a specific buyer in 1455 on the 27th of February. You can see why printed indulgences were so handy. The bulk of the text is the same from one to the next, and small blank spaces can be left to be filled in by hand with the particulars for each center. And you can see here, if you can read your Latin and your old handwriting, <laughs> that it gives the, the date uh, 1455 on the 27th of the month of February. There are other copies of the Gutenberg indulgences that have survived. This one is a slightly later issue. It's the 31-line indulgence, not the 30-line, for those of you who are bibliophiles. Now part of Princeton's collections, this indulgence was issued on the 29th of April, 1455, in Fudendorf to Johannes Grosshans. You can just barely make out the fact that there was a manuscript insertion. You can see the sort of blank space in the middle, but not the handwriting. But this copy hasn't survived in nearly nice a shape as the last one we were looking at. It's astonishing, actually, that any of these indulgences survived. Very few of them did. Even though print runs for indulgences were huge, often in the thousands, there are only 50 recorded surviving copies of the 31-line indulgence and a mere eight extant copies of the 30-line. When you look at an indulgence, it's easy to see why they wouldn't survive in large numbers. They're just flimsy little things. Compare this indulgence, printed by Winkin de Word in 1498, to the Nuremberg Chronicle, printed in 1493, in a glorious 18 by 12 by 4 inch binding 
of about 300 leaves. Actually, it's nearly impossible in this photograph to get a sense of the chronicle's heft, even when placed side by side with an image of the indulgence. And actually, I'm not even sure that that's an accurate representation. I totally sort of eyeballed it based on what I knew about the formats, which um, is not a good way of doing it. But I think it shows what my main point is. The Chronicle is big, and it's durable because it's big. The wooden boards and leather of the binding protect the text within, and the brass armor protects the binding without. You can't easily tear or lose this book. Trust me on this, it takes me two hands and some fair amount of concentration to set it safely on a cradle so I can show it to my students. But a single sheet of paper, that gets misplaced. It gets accidentally destroyed, it gets forgotten. The light breeze could blow it away if you weren't paying attention. And once the holder has died, do you need to hang out to an indulgence as a record of your grandfather's purchase? I actually don't know whether that's true or not. But the disposability of indulgences is why they haven't survived. But it's also why the ones that survived did. Here's what I mean. Because the indulgences weren't seen as precious documents to save, they were perfect to reuse for other purposes. And the early indulgences that survived often did so because they were used as waste paper and binding. Without launching into a lecture on early modern binding structures, although I'm sure you would like me to do that, I'll just say that bindings often incorporated paper left over from other projects. End papers, those bits of paper at the front and the beginning of the book after the covers, um, spine lindings, structural supports, binders needed materials to finish their books. And why would you use good blank paper? paper that could be used for other purposes, paper that might be more valuable when it's blank than hidden away in a binding, when you had scrap paper at hand. And so odds and ends of printed paper were incorporated into the bindings of books. Here's one picture of the paste down for the front cover and the first end leaf, and you can see that's not text that you're meant to read. That's text that was printed for another book and then reused in here. Here's another book in which there's no paste down, so you can see the sort of leather turn-ins on the edge, but if you look over on the right, the first leaf, again, the orientation is the wrong way. That shows you that scrap paper, and then look next to it, there's another little bit of scrap paper that's sort of a guard for the spine. This one, I love this book, because it's falling apart, so what you're looking at on the right is the beginning of the book, but the spine has sort of become detached, and so the spine and the front board have flopped open, and you can see on the left, there's a nice white covering of the inside board, but you can just see this edge uh, with a little bit of print sticking out. That's some scrap paper, that's some manuscript that's been tucked in there and glued over and is now only visible because the binding is falling apart. If we turn back to the indulgences that I've shown you, you'll see that being treated as disposable is how they survive. The 30 line indulgence, now at Manchester, was preserved in a binding. If you look at the upper corner, you can see the evidence of holes in the corners and the stain left from the leather turnips. And this copy, now at Princeton, survived as paste downs, that piece of paper that's glued to the front cover or the back cover, in a binding from the early 1470s. Here we see something slightly different. These are indulgences that were never sold, and so are still in sheet form. For indulgences to a sheet, would cut them up in separate pieces to be able to sell them to your sinners. This is one of my favorite examples because it doubles as evidence of something we normally wouldn't see, the production technique displayed of the unfinished object. Because it was disposable, it was preserved. It's not a preservation technique I'd recommend, but it's worked for more than a few texts. I'll let you deal with what this might mean for digital preservation. I know just a tiny bit enough about digital forensics to gather that bits of data cling to other bits of data, and that you might be looking to recover someone's novel only to find that other records of their life are interspersed with it, but I really can't do more than that. Instead, I'll ask what lessons we might learn from this about using digital iterations of material objects. For starters, 
It's worth pointing out that I wouldn't have been able to give this talk if these objects hadn't been photographed and shared online. It was because I was looking for images of indulgences for a different talk, one that was working to blur the distinction between print and manuscript, you can ask me about that later if you want, that I came across these pictures and noticed that they all looked like binder's waste. Discoverability shouldn't be news, but it shouldn't be forgotten either. The problem that we're facing in my world, the world of early modern book historians, is that the digital objects we're producing sometimes leads to wonky discoveries. Here's one thing that's been bothering me recently, the size of books. Here we have two books of Psalms, one printed in Geneva in 1576, on your left with the border, one printed in Italy, uh, let's see, in Florence in 1566, on your right. They are, to all appearances, the same size. But this is how their comparative sizes should be displayed. The Italian Psalter is 21 centimeters tall, and the Geneva Psalter is 13 centimeters, or about the height of a Sharpie. Of course, here, these images you're looking at, it looks significantly larger than a Sharpie, um, a not unrelated oddity of working with digitizations of material texts. Uh, and material objects, the size isn't stable, and big is a constantly shifting uh, marker. Here we see a collection of books as we would see them in the Folgers Digital Image Collection, a collection that is rich and wonderful and fabulous, displayed side by side. Here are those same images shown in relation to each other. I arbitrarily chose one book as my standard, the second one on the top row, and adjusted the scale of the images from there. There's some really big ones. The first one on the upper left is so big that it doesn't even fit on the screen. Look how tiny that one is on the bottom right. It's a tiny little book. It's just four centimeters tall. I arbitrarily, oops, I said that this slide does a much better job of conveying the relative size of these books. On the other hand, it's a rotten way of browsing through a collection of images if you're at all interested in any feature other than size. In other words, if you want to treat these images as books, as objects that you hold in your hand and read, then you're going to be dissatisfied. They're always going to be digital surrogates, a phrase I hate, that are lacking the primacy of the original. But what if we took the disembodied aspect of these images of books as an opportunity rather than a failure? Here's a fun fact about early printing that is all about its material process. Many printed works are illustrated with woodcuts, images that are literally made from blocks of wood. I just want to make an aside that it is amazing that the folder has the piece of wood that made this exact print. That is what that wood block is. It is what printed that. And then, of course, it was hand colored in later. The amazing thing, actually, that I don't show in this image is on the back side of that piece of wood is another woodcut. Because just like you reuse paper, because why let a good piece of paper go to waste? Why let a good block of wood go to waste? Use the other side, and now it's a reversible image. In any case, one of the results of illustrations being made from blocks of wood is that the blocks of wood can be reused to print illustrations in different works. The Bodleian Ballads Project at Oxford has taken this fact and combined it with image search technology to begin to explore how images in Renaissance ballads are used and reused. Alexandra Franklin made this excellent discovery, starting with noticing this distinctive hat used in Unconstant Phyllis, a late 17th century lament by a shepherd about the woman he loves. Using image match across their database, she searched across their collection for other instances of the hat, pulling up eight hits including this one from the Noble Gallant. What's particularly excellent about this reuse is that we can see that although it's the same hat with the same little wood holes from little worms eating their way through it, the man wearing the hat is not. They've taken that one piece of wood and they've combined it with a different piece of wood, and now you've got a removable hat. <laughs> Why might this be a useful discovery? Tracing the use of a wood block across multiple printings and multiple works can help date printing. It can also help us think about iconography and shifting discourses. For me, 
This is also a useful discovery for the way it turns material objects into digital ones that can be dismembered and rearranged. It's not strictly necessary to use digital tools to do this sort of image hunting work. Ruth Laborski and Elizabeth Ingram compiled their guide to early English <coughs> printed books without the use of image matching technology, but it's certainly much easier to do it with bits than with books. What can digitization offer that material objects cannot? Tools to reshape objects that would break under physical pressure. The work done on the Great Parchment Book by the University College London Center for Digital Humanities is the most recent and exciting example of what those possibilities are. The Great Parchment Book is a survey compiled in 1639 of all the estates and dairy managed by the City of London through the Irish Society and the City of London Livery Companies. It's a remarkable set of records, but you can see what I'm also about to say. It's a collection of 165 leaves that were badly damaged by a fire in 1786. The entire thing. It survived, but it looks like this. Through careful preservation, about 50% of the text was recovered, but the brittle, wrinkled parchment remained an intractable obstacle to further work. But after extensive physical preservation work on the manuscript and detailed imaging, the UCL team was able to virtually unwrinkle the pages. About 90% of the text of the Great Parchment Book is now readable and available for examination online as images of leaves, enhanced images, or a transcription of the text. In both of these cases, digitization makes available objects for study that would otherwise be restricted either because they're too fragile to handle or they're too dispersed to work with. For someone invested in cultural heritage, these are remarkable accomplishments. We can't study the past if we can't access its records and artifacts. But both of these projects are ones that require significant investments of time, money, and people. They're not lightweight experimentation. You need high resolution images, you need expertise in image manipulation, you need the physical objects at hand. I want to end with a look at something that is the opposite of all this. Something that builds off of what has already been done, publicizing and redeploying images without adding to them, or indeed displaying them. The Library of Elf is a Twitter account that tweets the captions of prints and photographs in the Library of Congress's digital collections. The tweets are nothing more than the captions. No images themselves, no links to them. Just the captions, with occasional reminders that anyone can find these images by searching the Library of Congress. Here's the record that corresponds with the tweet at the top of the screen. House burning during Groveland reign of terror. Negroes driven from homes throughout area. This is what the Library of Alice tweet stream looked like the day after the verdict of George Zimmerman's trial was announced. It was a relentless account of the history of African Americans from slavery through Jim Crow through the Civil Rights Movement. The person who created the Library of Aleph hadn't created it for this purpose. It was really an account he had put together of, to be able to tweet out some of the interesting things he was finding as he was playing around with the library's archives and he didn't want to clutter, clutter up his main account. But in his anger after the verdict, it became a platform for remembering and reliving our past. I bring it up here because of this paradox. What makes the tweets so powerful, I think, is that they are disconnected from the material object they're referencing. They're just captions. We might pause over images, but we pause over these. What are we reading? Who wrote the captions? What does it mean to choose these words to describe these images? I love this as an example of the ways in which we can have the past connect to the present. Things that speak to us today can speak to things that spoke to us in the past. And we can use digital technologies to bring them together. 
But what I really take out of this, what I really find interesting for thinking about what cultural heritage organizations can do in terms of preserving our pasts and using digital tools to do that, is that this is an account that came not from the Library of Congress, but from an unaffiliated user. The Library of Congress did all of the hard work in creating the metadata, putting these online, making it discoverable, and then making it open so that somebody else could do with it something powerful. And it's that that I think that organizations like my own and like many of the ones that you all work at need to think about in terms of what it means for preservation and use of the digital objects that we are creating. We need to make them open so that other people can do things with them that it would never occur to us to do for ourselves. Thank you. You mentioned that big is a constantly shifting marker. How and why is it a constantly shifting marker? How and why is it? Um, big, is only, big only makes sense when it's in reference to something else. Right, so um, I'm suddenly reminded of the Phantom Toll Booth, because I have little kids and I was reading this to them recently, and you, there's this moment in the Phantom Toll Booth and you go to the house, there's a sign above the door and it says, the world's tallest man. And he knocks, and Milo knocks on the door, and this totally average-sized man opens it up. And Milo says, you don't look so tall. And he says, well, you know, to a very small person, I look huge. And Milo walks around to the other side of the house and knocks on the door that says, the world's smallest man. And of course, it's the exact same man who then explains, well, if you were, you know, if you were super tall, I would look very small. Um, the problem with physical books, physical objects, is that size matters. Um, the uses that we put of them, the information that they tell us about their reception, about their history, about their production, um, all of that is connected to the size. But once it becomes a digital object, we lose the frame of references that we might have that let us um, discern that size otherwise. Um, in that sense, digital tools are super fabulous because you can take a really big book and you can fit it on your computer screen and you can turn the pages on it without having to constantly readjust it. You can, the example I usually give of this is the AIDS quilt. So you know the digitization project that they've been, the name projects that are working on with Microsoft, in which they've digitized the entirety of the quilt. And you can look at it all at once, and it all fits on a computer screen. And that's something we could not do in real life. It is too big to fit in any one physical space. And the flip side of that is you can take something really tiny, and you can blow it up, and we can see you know, things much smaller than cells in our bodies. Um, but if what you want to use digital tools to do is to convey the material um, objects that organizations like my own and people tell us that we are interested in, uh, that I think is a problem that is a problem that we haven't yet solved. Maybe it's just an opportunity waiting for an answer. Um, you mentioned not really liking the term digital surrogate, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, could you talk, is it just the term, or do you, like, what do you see the relationship between the physical and the digital being? Yeah. I suddenly realized when I said that that I'd forgotten to then complete the full circle and go back and talk about why I hate the phrase digital surrogate. Um, it gets used a lot in, uh, in the library world as, um, it's a substitute, right? So that if something is too fragile to handle, you can look at the surrogate, and then if you can make a really good argument about why you need to see the original object, they will let you not look at the microfilm, but look at the object itself. Um, but what I don't like about that phrase is that it suggests that there is some sort of equivalency between the digital representation of it and the thing itself, and that the thing itself is always going to be better. 
I really think that these images that we are producing and creating of material objects are not surrogates for it, they are new objects in their own right. Um, and if we don't think of them as being objects in their own right, they're always going to disappoint us. They're never going to, we're not going to be able to pick them up, we're not going to be able to know how big things are, we're not going to be able to, I don't know, smell the books, um, and we're not going to know how to preserve them the other part of it. But once we think of um, them not as being surrogates, but as being objects that have their own use, and that in some ways are better representations, they're just different iterations of the original object, then I think that lets us do things differently with them. Thank you for asking me about that, so I didn't leave that hanging there. So I, I thought the, the two talks today had an interesting connection in that there's, in both cases, there's an interest in studying um, texts and reading and sort of interpreting texts. Um, so um, to some extent, I'd be interested in sort of whatever resonances you see between um, sort of the, the, this, you know, 500 years lesson learned and um, what we have around from print culture and um, sort of the kinds of things that we can do. In, uh, with the, the bit to get it, that might, if, if there's anything that sparks in your mind about uh, things that really matter or, you know, wisdom about um, you know, 500 years of experience in that. So. One thing I as a 500 year old who's been studying printed books since the beginning. Um, I do think that there are mistakes that we've made in the, in the past that we don't make in the future. And that one is there has been a tendency. Um, among literary scholars to think of the text as somehow being separate from the physical metadata that surrounds it, which is sort of my understanding of what bindings and format and paper and type and font can tell us. All of those are bits of metadata that help us understand the context um, and the creation of the object. Um, but all of that is part and parcel. Um, and I, I really love the sort of thinking about bitly length and what gets saved is all of that metadata tells us something really interesting. Um, it is not disposable, but it's sort of an integral part of what is being, um, what is being together. Um, but what I, I was also really struck listening to um, Hillary's talk was thinking about um, how you can't save everything. And I mean, you, I, I'm preaching to the choir, you all know that you can't, save, you can't save everything, and we don't know what the future wants us to have saved. We know what we want to have saved, but we can and should do the best that we can to save the things that we judge need to be saved. But some of the most interesting bits and pieces of text that I work with back from my period are... <laughs> right? I can just imagine that. <laughs> I thought for a second I was like, sort of hallucinating. <laughs> That's really nice that they've all been saved, but some of the most interesting things that we have from the past are the stuff that gets saved accidentally, the bits that get tucked into bindings, um, the things that somebody sort of meant to throw away and never really got around to it. I don't know what the equivalent is for us today and the work that um, everyone here is doing to preserve things. Um, for me, it has resulted in a kind of um, deep breath and letting go of some of my obsessive compulsive tendencies to want to save everything and to just say you know what I'm just letting it go um, and I will trust that the stuff that really matters to me to have saved I will have saved and I cannot save everything and that will be okay the stuff that I save accidentally will be as important as the stuff that I don't fortunately I'm just me I'm not the folder so I'm sure my colleagues are the folder but not I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not a collective role, so I hope that answers your thanks for Are we good? Should we take the dimming of the lights as a sign that things are over? Thank you very much.